I'd like to invite our first speaker up here, Ben Sigri from the Surrey Wildlife Trust. Hi everyone. Um, uh, thank you to Carl and Jan for firstly having me first. Um, and secondly, inviting me to come along and speak to you and share a little bit about what I've been up to. Um, I wasn't entirely sure what to talk about, so hopefully um, what I'm talking about is useful and interesting to you guys. So um, I did the MSc Aquatic Science, as it was called then, back in, not sure, <laughs> 20, 2016, I think. Um, and I did it part-time, so over two years, and I was working at the Wildlife Trust then alongside it, and then kind of continued to work with them after I graduated. So this is a little bit about what I've been doing since. So, um, oh yeah, I should have put that slide up when I was talking about that. But yeah, this is some photos of me. Uh, I did my undergraduate at UCL as well. Um, had a great time doing that. Looked at some ponds in my master's with Carl. Um, and then, like I said, I've been working with the Wildlife Trust. So I started my journey with them in environmental education. So that's me in a badger outfit, and dressed up as Charles Darwin, and doing some popular things. So it's been great fun doing environmental education. But I wanted to use what I'd done in my master's a little bit more. So I've managed to kind of move internally, um, and the NGOs are really great with that, especially the Wildlife Trust, into more GIS and research, and using a lot more of the skills that I gained during my master's. So, in terms of what I do now, um, I've moved, like I said, into doing a bit more techy stuff, doing a bit more scientific research and things like that. So um, I have a really varied role, which is really fun, and I get to do a lot of what I want to. So um, I'm involved in our research prospectus, which is a program we send out to universities to get BSc and MSc students doing their dissertation projects with us. I get to do um, conferences like this one and talking about our work get to go and look at things in the field still, go and do surveying, things like that. I get to do a bit of teaching, um, and I also do a lot of our kind of app development um, and survey technology, as well as modeling stuff on computers. So it's really, really varied and really, really fun. Um, and a lot of my kind of focus of my work is the idea of evidence-based con conservation. I think um, we feel as an organization historically that conservation can be quite anecdotal, especially when you're working kind of with landowners and farmers and stakeholders. Um, but we want to ensure that the decisions we're making in kind of real life are actually based on science and evidence, not just on kind of, well, we've always done it that way. So um, some examples of that are obviously biodiversity in a game, which is a really big topic at the moment. Um, and one of the projects we're working on is where we could reintroduce some uh, chalk grassland across the North Downs. So for those of you who don't know, sorry, we've got a really big bridge of chalk throughout our county called the North Downs, um, and it's got a lot of lovely chalk grasslands on it. So as part of net gain offsetting, we want to offer some kind of nice sites to put more chalk grassland back in. Um, I'm using um, an activity modeling, which are those nice kind of diagrams down the bottom. We kind of model if we put in all of the chalk grassland we wanted to, how much more joined up would the North Downs be for the species that use those kind of habitats? So using evidence and sort of science and modeling to support decisions we were making on the ground. Another example of that is um, what we've done recently with the local county council, looking at green corridors through the urban areas of the county. So again, um, all of this would go into the kind of local planning policies and things like that. So it's been really great to be involved in that and help inform what then the local borough councils are actually going to do on the ground in terms of their urban green spaces. Um, so the rest of what I was going to talk about is hopefully on the in terms of what are the kind of conservation issues at the moment and then what might the future be like. So as you're probably all aware, these big four issues are kind of relevant probably to all of us, both in our jobs and in our personal lives. So obviously the ecological crisis, economic crisis, a bit rubbish at the moment, uh, but then also, alongside the climate crisis, there was sort of health and connection crisis. That's something, as wildlife trust, we think a lot about in terms of how people are becoming more disconnected with nature and how could that can affect their health. Um, so for us, uh, as is the case in many places, it's not a good, good story at the moment. We've done, we did a recent report in 2018 and found that basically a third of our species are either extinct or under threat. And of the priority species, 37% are currently not defining, and 31% are already extinct, which is not great. Um, so the data I don't know if you will see this show, uh, had five suggestions for what you can do 
to combat these issues on a global scale. However, as someone who does not work on a global scale, works in quite a small local scale, um, what we try and do is take those kind of global messages and apply them to a local context. And I think that's the real strength of people like the British Trust and the Wildlife Trust who have all those kind of local branches because they have that local knowledge and the local context of what they're doing. So how do we take kind of big global ideas that David Attenborough is talking about and apply them to what we actually have, which we don't have any coastlines, obviously, but we have wetlands and rivers, we have chalk grasslands, heathlands, and obviously we have loads of ancient woodland as well, because lovely bluebells and things like that. So the first thing that David Attenborough suggests we should do is about reducing population growth um, and providing economic stability, raising people out of poverty. Obviously, as a wildlife trust, we cannot go around telling people to stop having babies. But what we do want to do is work with people who are already in our county and provide opportunities, empower young people to be more involved. As um, with many counties kind of adjacent to London, there's a huge pressure for development and population growth at the moment. So it's, it's really key that we work with people. Um, they are inherently connected to nature. And there's a great quote from David Attenborough that I always forget. But it's essentially along the lines of, if you don't know about it, you don't care about it. And if you don't care about it, you're not going to protect it. So we want to make sure that obviously people do know about it and therefore can care about it and protect it. Um, but we also want to work with young people because lots of research has been done to show that there's a big gap in terms of that you care about nature when you're young because you're like, yeah, bugs are cool. And then you care about it when you're an adult because um, you go for dog walks and other things and appreciate it there. But kind of while you're a teenager or a young adult, there's a big gap in people actually being engaged at all with the natural world. So we want to try and plug that gap because obviously people of that age group at the moment are really crucial because they will be the people signing up to this course in the coming years, but also going to be people making decisions and a government and things like that. And then as a kind of also part of that, it's about making the sector more diverse because the environmental sector is the second least diverse sector in the UK, which is pretty rubbish. Um, there's a figure of saying it's about 97% white, and there are figures for either kind of diversity groups, but I'm sure it's all similar. So we want to, again, provide opportunities to try and address those inequalities in the industry. Second thing that David Ambrose suggests we do is about phasing out fossil fuel use. And again, not something we can do a lot about as a small local charity, um, but we can reflect on our own practices and try and improve the climate Place. So um, we do a lot of internal reflection about right to work schemes and things like that. And I'm sure with many of you as a result of the pandemic, there's a lot more um, working from home being done and hybrid working, which is great because it's obviously reducing everyone's travel time and carbon emissions. Um, but then also a lot of the habitat management we're doing is uh, relevant to carbon sequestration as well. So um, it used to be common practice that when work parties would go out and do scrub clearance, they would just burn it because actually all of the volunteers are pyromaniacs. But <laughs> we realized that actually the kind of impact of that was really negligated, negligating the work they were actually doing. So now instead of burning what they, what they clear, we put it into scrub piles, which actually provide habitat as well. Um, and then the other thing we're really keen about at the moment is hedgerows, which are more exciting than they sound. Um, and they're a very, very important part of carbon sequestration and can sequester up to 50% more carbon than forestry, as well as linking up the landscape and providing lovely habitat and things like that. So um, we're, we're really keen on hedgerows at the moment as well. Third thing is about protecting the oceans, reducing plastic. Again, very landlocked county, far away from the oceans, so we want to focus on our rivers and wetlands instead. Um, unfortunately, water bowls and otters are functionally extinct in Surrey. Water bowls especially have been gone for a very long time. We occasionally get an otter that might swim through, but it doesn't hang around very long. Um, and obviously, as we're probably all familiar with from doing our course, that there's a massive trend in freshwater decline globally, and lots of local rivers just mirror that as well. So in terms of what we're trying to do to be involved in that, it's about just doing river restoration projects, um, addressing catchment sources, and working with catchment partnerships with rivers trusts and other organizations. And also trying as best we can to deal with invasive species as well. Things like um, obviously signal crayfish and whether or not it's um, actually good news or not. A project I was doing this year was looking for demon shrimp in uh, the way and we didn't actually manage to find any. So 
either the students doing it were not looking very hard or they're not there anymore, which would be great. Um, fourth is about reducing the meat and eating more plant-based. Again, cannot go out into Surrey and tell people to start being vegetarian, but we can work in our own way with the agricultural sector. So we have um, cows, they're very cute, and they uh, are part of our conservation grazing program. So it's um, something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but the idea of instead of doing kind of traditional um, things like mowing or manual clearance, you can just leave, leave the cows there basically and they do it for you. So um, they do a much better job than machinery can. They co-evolve with a lot of the things they're grazing on. Um, so for example, we have some that graze our short grassland and they preferentially will eat the grass basically and they'll leave behind wildflowers that are needed as food plants for the different butterflies. Um, they do eventually go into burgers, but they are obviously a much more sustainable source of meat than um, if you were just going to McDonald's or something like that. Um, we also work with farmers and with agro-environment schemes and things like that, um, getting them to do better things on their land, essentially. Um, and with the upcoming Elm scheme, we want to really use that as an opportunity to make sure that farmers are you know, taking the right actions on their land and that they're not kind of dissuaded by all the bureaucracy and red tape around um, grass. And lastly, about halting deforestation and planting more trees. That's a really interesting one um, in our context because Surrey is the most wooded county in England. So actually, we've already got loads of trees and for us, it's about planting the right trees in the right places. Um, we, like I mentioned before, we have um, lots of lowland heathland and short grassland, which are both incredibly rare, valuable habitats in their own right. Short grassland is allegedly the European equivalent of a tropical rainforest. And lowland heathland obviously is an internationally protected habitat um, and has lots of um, designations like Ramsar sites, uh, SACs, SPAs, and things like that. Um, Surrey is a really important stronghold for both of those habitats because of our geology um, and just our kind of local history. So, although um, the County Council has promised to plant like two million trees, we want to really ensure that that tree planting doesn't happen in either of these places because it's really important to maintain these for their own biodiversity value and to ensure that it doesn't just become more with them. So trees in the right places, but then also the right species of trees as well. So absolutely, plant trees in gardens, plant trees in urban green spaces, but not on really important open habitats as well. Um, so just some reflections before I wrap up about the future. Um, as is my role in the Trust, I would like to think that technology will be playing a really big role in the future of conservation. So lots of things I'm involved with, um, you know, with GIS, drones, using digital survey forms, it's all massively increasing, thankfully, the efficiency of what people are doing. So increasing the efficiency for our consultants, for our um, project managers, using it in citizen science as well, it's making it more accessible and much easier for people to collect data. So you know, historically, our citizen science volunteers would go out, um, they'd write some stuff down about the river fly survey they'd done, and then they'd send us in a silky muddy piece of paper, which would then sit in a cupboard for a while until someone eventually put it on the system. So I think that this is going to play a big role in increasing the efficiency. And as you know, I'm sure you're all aware, a kind of chronically underfunded sector, giving people more time to do things is going to be really valuable and hopefully mean that we get more stuff going on. And then um, that picture with the planes is obviously not, we're not doing anything with planes, but the idea. Um, around AI and machine learning coming into it. So that there's going to be a really exciting project that um, we're going to be involved with about recognizing habitat using machine learning and AI from high res satellite imagery. So again, technology hopefully playing a really exciting role. Um, Nature-based solutions as well is um, a frame I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So the idea that we need to work with people from with different perspectives, economic perspectives, and show them how that the the biodiversity and the climate crisis are interlinked, and we need to make sure that you, if we're telling people, why don't you plant these trees here, or why don't you put a hedgerow in your field, they're seeing that not only as a biodiversity thing, they're seeing it as a climate change thing, but they're also seeing it how it can be economically beneficial to them as well. So I think it's really about you know making people realize that everything is all integrated, it's all one system, they're not kind of separate spheres. Um, 
So I think the, and I'm sure Craig will probably mention later, the idea of a kind of wild future and having a living landscape, as we've called it over the years, where people in nature live in harmony would be lovely. I'd like to think that we can get there one day, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room are going to play it or are already playing a massive part in that. So, yeah, hopefully finish on a positive note. But thank you very much for listening, um, and I look forward to uh, meeting and catching up with some of you later on the day.